the most interesting thing in this world is to answer the question he was trying to answer. Uh, several years ago, I gave this talk at, uh, at NASA. And at NASA, they're very serious. You know, the only Olympiad problems I can solve to this day are those where I can kind of find a you know, theoretical basis for them. Every year, life is a little less scary. And it's, you know, I very much appreciate it. <laughs>
So my passion is a uh, uh, kind of at the level of a 13 year old and B uh, uh, from 30 years ago. Uh, so I, I feel a little awkward uh, uh, practicing it in public, but, uh, uh, but certainly you know, when we first came to Israel, that wasn't the case at all. And, uh, and the fact that math doesn't need many words was incredibly helpful. It's also, it's true that most of my high school friends are people I met, not all, but the majority are people I met in this uh, math circle. Again, because somehow communication was easiest, uh, uh, easiest on that topic. Actually, um, I realized when talking to a colleague who also moved um, from Russia when she was very young. And um, I really enjoyed talking Russian to her because it was very warm and cozy and like home language. You could you could feel that she only speaks this language with people who really love her and she loves them. <laughs> and it's such a pleasant feeling. <laughs> that is very funny. That is very funny. I actually, I, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. So you're saying that uh, learning math in a language you didn't know was somehow uh, doable because I, I imagine it should be hard, like math is hard and a new language is hard and the combination uh, sounds scary to me. <laughs> so a friend of mine, uh, he, he came from uh, Russia to, to the US and he said for the first year he would go to math talks and sometimes he would learn some math and some, sometimes he would learn some English, but uh, rarely both. Uh, but I, I think for me, uh, you know, I like when I started school in Israel, I probably knew most of the math I was being taught. And so I purely uh, uh, utilized those language, those lessons to, to study Hebrew. <laughs> That's convenient. <laughs> and so you mentioned the joy you get from mathematics. What is uh, your favorite part of doing research? What gives you the most joy? Well, just this feeling that I, I just know, you know, I, I just found out something that nobody else knows. It's pretty amazing, you know, it's like uh, discovering new lens, except uh, from, from uh, the convenience of my own office. Oh, really? Only I know how to build a graph with these and those properties. And then only I know that this is best possible. Then, of course, the next thing is to go and tell everybody. But uh, <laughs> is it important for you that other people uh, are interested in how to build such a graph or you would be happy anyway, even if no one else can? It depends a little bit. I think when I first start working on something, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's always motivated by a question some, somebody asked or, you know, a question that I, like some, some known uh, niche of interest. Uh, but then once I get into it, it becomes more, uh, you know, uh, I know that I want to know the answer to that, and eventually I'll convince people that they want to know the answer to kind of an evolution. Oh, cool. I mean, I do think that eventually it is about, uh, you know, I think this is an important question to answer. And what changes is whether, uh, you know, other people already agree with me or I still need to convince them of that. Usually at the beginning, it comes from something that's Acceptable, accepted as an important question in with time, I feel like. Now, now I know what's important. How would you try to explain that something is important since it's a subjective thing? So what, what can't- That's a very good question. I, you know, if I knew, if I, if I had a recipe for that, my life would be much easier or, or maybe harder. Um, I mean, I think at the end, it's about putting it in a context. It's about finding a context in which it is natural. And, uh, you know, I, so let, let, let me digress a little bit. I, many years ago, I went to a seminar lecture by John Conway. And I have to say, to this day, I think this is the best lecture I've ever attended in my life. He started talking about something that I had, I knew nothing about, I had no interest in. And in the course of the 45 minutes, the first 45 minutes, he managed to build up this subject in such a way that it just seems so interesting. I really wanted to know what, would, what the answer to this question would be. And it wasn't even so much, you know, connect, connecting it to other things. I think that he did in the last 10 minutes and I didn't understand most of it. But he just started from the beginning and, and built this world in which it was clear to every audience member that the, the most interesting thing in this world is to answer the question he was trying to answer. Well. And 
I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not nearly that good, but, but that really taught me something. You just have to build a world. You have to kind of make a coherent story in which this is the most important question. And, you know, and people will agree with you. It's, that, that's what math is about. You build this world and then you study how this world behaves. So you just have to not be lazy explaining the world. Oh, cool. So when you prepare a math talk, are you trying to build up a little world each time? Yeah, I try. I try. You know, some, someday I'll be one-tenth as good as Conway, but uh, certainly I try. You know, it, of course, it helps if you can somehow, if you don't have to start from scratch and you can start with a context that already exists. It saves you some time in building the world. But, uh, uh, but, but eventually, I think that's what it's about. Somehow you have to walk your audience to, to a point where you... You know, there is a reason why I think something is important, right? I didn't just decide it one day I woke up and I decided it. Somehow in my mind, it was built up to, to get there. So you just have to say it you know, clearly and, and like, like, like you convinced yourself. And so uh, I'm curious. So you, you work in graph theory. Actually, why, why did you choose graph theory as a field? You know, that was kind of a coincidence. I wanted to do discrete math and uh, the place where I ended up uh, being accepted for PhD graph theory was a you know, very active area there. And Paul Seymour, my advisor, was you know, a big graph theorist working there. So it's kind of, it happened. So um, you've been working in graph theory for many years. And um, from what I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, of course, the uh, theorems and conjectures you're thinking about uh, change throughout the years, but the objects you work with, like graphs and with certain properties, uh, might be um, the same over the years? So yeah, so somehow it's, it's, oh, that wasn't the question. Uh, so I was wondering whether uh -huh. you ever, I don't know, feel bored to introduce the same things in your talk? Well, I mean, I don't really start from the very start. The fact that somehow in my life, it's you know one kind of coherent uh, story of how one problem led to another. But I uh, I don't tell uh, you know, the whole story every time. I start in some starting point. Uh, my grandmother used to say every story her mom told started with so when my dad moved from Belarus to Siberia in 1893. So I don't start every story in 1893. But, uh... <laughs> How do you uh, feel about explaining uh, your math to non-mathematicians? Uh, you know, I do my best. I used to, when I was younger, I, I, didn't, I didn't like it. I felt like, you know, they don't really want to know and I don't really want to explain. But now I kind of feel like it's my responsibility to do it, you know, like you hear about, uh, you hear how uh, sort of we, we talk about general education, but math is somehow not part of it. And I, I forget that there's some quote, like somehow an educated person is expected to know so much more literature than math. It's embarrassing. It's some, some, something like that. The things you're allowed not to know in math and still be considered an educated person are amazing. Uh, and so I, you know, I took it to her. I feel like if somebody, if somebody asks, it's my job to really make an effort to explain enough that they understand something. You know, of course, I'm, you know, I, I don't really explain what I work on to them. They, they don't want to know. But, but to give them some kind of general picture so that they could live with the feeling, you know, I have some idea what a mathematician does now. I, I feel like it's my job now. This is funny. I actually noticed that the less math people know, the more I enjoy explaining math to them because then I'm less afraid that, that they will immediately say that something I'm saying is wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's very true. I, I think there's a, like, that's kind of a middle layer. Like, there are people who really don't know any math at all and they just want to hear something about what a mathematician does. And that's, you know, I, I think that's important, but it's kind of hard. It's just a completely different thing. It's, it's not really explaining math. It's, explaining something else. Then there are the people, I think, that you described who know enough that you can tell them something, but, uh, but, but you know, they're not, not going to catch mistakes. That's, that's definitely the best audience. <laughs> I completely agree with you. And then, the, and then there are the people who are going to look for your mistakes. That's, 
they're useful. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's not even mistakes, mistakes, but like, you know, experts in your field immediately point out to imprecise things that you say, and you're trying to tell a story. You don't want to give all the details right away. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> uh, so so we're in Jerusalem now, and my son and I went on a tour of the old city with this amazing, amazing guide, and she was so interesting. And then we sat down to rest and have a cup of coffee, and she asked me what I do, and I said I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mathematician. She said, "Oh, that's very interesting." And then my son said, "Mom, tell tell her what you really do." You know, she told us so much about what she knows. Now you should tell her what you do. And there was just this, you know, pressure. I, like normally I would kind of laugh my way out of it, but uh, uh, but I felt like, you know, I can't disappoint my baby. <laughs> I have to tell her. And then, you know, and I tried and uh, I don't know, I, I hope she enjoyed it. I did my best, <laughs> but uh, somehow there was a lot of pressure there. <laughs> was your son happy? I think he was happy, yeah. <laughs> so a few years ago, so I have this general audience talk that I give, and it always has the same title, but really it changes. I probably change the title so people don't feel like I'm uh, cheating them, but it's really every time it's a different talk. And uh, uh, several years ago, I gave this talk at, uh, at NASA. And at NASA, they're very serious. So first of all, there are two dates for your talk. The first date and then the date on which it will happen if something happens on the first date. That's how we launch, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you call them rockets. That's how we schedule math. So the date and the backup date. And then, you know, two weeks in advance, they, uh, they wanted to talk to me and I see my slides and kind of have a preview of what I was going to do. And then they said, oh, well, that's very nice, but you should have an historical introduction into the field. And, you know, first I was a little bit annoyed because, like, seriously, you're going to tell me what talk to give. And then I stopped being annoyed and I thought, you know, maybe they know what they're talking about. They're NASA after all. Maybe they have some <laughs> idea. And so I added uh, three or five slides about, about the uh, bridge of Königsberg and how Euler uh, uh, built a you know, graph model to, to uh, um, uh, explain this problem. And you know what? It's been the best part of my talk ever since. I think everybody loves it. Uh, I, I certainly enjoy talking about it. That's what I told our tour guide in Jerusalem, uh, except I couldn't remember how to build the bridges. It was a little bit embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 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 but uh, yeah, but, but in the end, it's nice. It's, it's one problem. Everybody you know, who wants to listen to me can understand it. And uh, then you know, they can choose or not choose to listen to the Know, cutting edge mass that I'm trying to simplify to make it a general audience talk. But, but that's nice and that everybody can understand. And that's a self-contained world and a self-contained story. So, How was it talking with NASA? You know, I, I don't remember anymore. I, th I think it was very nice. Certainly it was very nice. Like, you know, you come for the whole day and different people talk to you and, you know, it's fascinating. They build stuff that goes to space. I certainly remember it as a very positive experience. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I don't remember how, what I thought about my talk. I think it was fine. <laughs> Not nearly as exciting as looking at the, you know, the, the equipment that's about to be sent to Mars. <laughs> I mean, I was curious, did they ask some unexpected questions or? You know, I, I don't want to lie because I really don't remember. I my talk was not the highlight for me. <laughs> Now, you know, if I leave this in the video, people will assume that you signed the paper that does not allow you to, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> to speak about your experience at NASA. No. no, I can tell you, yeah, I, so you drive in and they have this uh, huge electronic billboard with the events for the day. Like it's right at the, at the entrance. And it was pretty cool. There's like a huge uh, you know, picture of my face on this uh, big TV screen. I think I probably have a picture somewhere in my phone because I knew that wouldn't happen again. My face <laughs> on a blue board. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, no, I highly recommend the experience of talking at NASA. <laughs> it sounds like a Big Bang Theory episode. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of space exploration. So it was you know, fascinating to me to see it happen. Did it ever happen to you that you used somehow in real life 
your knowledge about graph theory? Um, well, I try to, for everything in my life, I try to build a graph algorithm to solve it. Uh, I, I mean, you probably uh, read this story that I often tell about uh, uh, seating, the seating chart at my wedding. Uh, uh, so my husband was very nervous about uh, um, uh, designing the seating chart because apparently it's a, it's a huge, you know, it takes forever and everybody's mad at you at the end and just, there's no good way about it. And I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it, but you have to promise not to be too picky. And uh, in the end, you know, it took me about 10 minutes. We didn't have a huge wedding. And uh, what I did was I ran a greedy coloring algorithm because uh, what's a seating chart? So you build a graph where you put an edge between two people if they shouldn't sit at the same table. And now what you want is to partition your guest list into what's called independent sets, sets with no edges inside. And in general, it's in fact an empty complete problem. So people are completely justified in saying that uh, it's very hard. But if the graph is sparse, then the greedy algorithm where you just uh, put everybody at the earliest table where he doesn't have any enemies, uh, if, if the graph is sparse, that you know that gives you a good approximation. And uh, you know, most communities are pretty sparse, like our friends and family, they don't know each other very well, so they, they don't hate each other. Too much. There are not too many pairs that hate each other. Uh, so, uh, you know, so it was very easy. I just did it and then it was fine. Um, when I read this in the, so it was in Quantum Magazine, right, in the article about your work, I thought it's, it's I, I assumed it's a fake story. <laughs> no, completely true. Completely true. I, I designed our city chart. For a while, I thought I should, you know, um, monetize that, uh, build an app for doing it. Uh, but uh, I need a partner. I need somebody who actually has something to do with events, not just with graph coloring. I haven't found on it. Well, I, 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 sorry, I assumed it's a fake story because it fits too well in the mathematical yeah. story. It was, it's like an article about you working on that problem, right? And then... <laughs> yeah, completely true. Everybody in the family knows. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Now there's, you know, to uh, make the model feel, fit better, right? So coloring means you partition into subsets without edges, and you want to partition into as few subsets as possible. So the seating chart, if you think about it at first, there's no kind of, no need to minimize the number of sets. But in fact, there is, because you have to put flowers on every table, and that costs a ton of money. So you really want to minimize the number of tables. Well, you also don't want every, like, no, the amount of tables be equal to the amount of people, they will be bored, right? <laughs> true. true. Yeah, that's, I mean, you certainly don't want that extreme. But uh, in fact, the fewer tables you can do it with, the better, the better off you are. <laughs> it's really amazing that uh, I think that you can apply in real life something from your research expertise, which is um, usually, I think, not the case in my field of studies. Well, um, oh, um, I work in the combination of algebraic topology and algebraic geometry, um, which is quite abstract. And so I recently read uh, an essay recommended uh, by one of the interviewees, uh, The Two Cultures in Mathematics mm -hmm. by Bowers. Um, mm -hmm. Highly recommend. I'll put the link in the video. Yeah, I read it too. It's, it's a great, great essay. But I'm curious. Um, what do you think of more abstract parts of mathematics? Um, I don't judge. I think uh, I, I think to every problem there is a story, and I think it's it all depends on what story you were told you know, growing up. I don't mean when you were three, but I mean when you were starting to kind of become a mathematician. And different people grow up with different stories, and that's probably what led them to to do the math they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the first math book I ever read was a number theory. I was a high school student and I uh, snuck into a library at the Technion and I pulled out a book. Uh, I, I forget which one, but something about primes. And, you know, it was fascinating. And I think if I happened to be talking to more people doing number theory, chances are it would have been number theory. Uh, as it happened, when I started studying, uh, the majority of people I encountered were doing some kind of combinatorial things and so I ended up being commentators. It's uh, one one question I'm in I'm, I'm I would like to know the answer to but I think nobody knows. Like are you 
you know, I think there's such a thing as mathematical ability, right? Like some people are better in math than others, and I don't think it's just about learning and studying. I think it's just something in your brain. But but are some people definitely better in topology, like if they tried, you know, ergodic theory, they just wouldn't be as good, but as topologists, they're amazing. Or, or, or is it not that high resolution? Is it just, you know, either you're good in math and then all the rest is uh, nurture or 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 not? Uh, so I'm very curious about that. Like, is there such a thing as being gifted in a particular field of mathematics? I don't know. My impression was that some people are more into problem solving while other people are more into learning in the early stages. And then I imagined, well, maybe it's a naive perspective that people who are more into problem solving, they more go into combinatorics, for example. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree. I think, uh, I mean, I certainly don't think of myself as a problem solver. Oh, really? Tell me more about it, because I'd like to break this stereotype in, in my head. <laughs> you know, I, 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 think, I think it's a misconception. I think any serious mathematics has a lot of theory. Uh, it's, I mean, I think in, in, in graph theory and combinatorics, we're struggling a little bit to kind of formalize it, uh, to, you know, to, to, to give our students something to study. Uh, but... There, there are layers and layers of, um, of, of knowledge on which current proofs are built. It's really not, uh, it's really not just like being, you know, I want to say being super smart, but that's not what I mean. It's, it's not a, a kind of a moment of uh, brilliance that gives you the solution. I think uh, maybe that was true 70 years ago, but uh, for better or worse, it's not true anymore. There's a lot of kind of built up knowledge. I think it's, you know, a younger field that doesn't yet have you know, a formal uh, canon to study from. But, uh, but, but there is definitely a lot, of, a lot of things you need to learn before you can do modern discrete math. Mm. I see. Yeah, I see. Really? Uh... I mean, you know, I, probably not as much as in your field, but 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 uh, yeah. I mean, when you know, when a, when a student first comes to me, I can't really really start talking to them. They have to learn some stuff first, not just what the graph is. Yeah. Okay. Sure. This makes sense. Everybody has their own opinion, and I think there are people who value this idea that you know, you come with one, you come up with one brilliant idea, and you've changed the field, and you know, and, and these people. Their, their opinion also has a value. I just, you know, that, that's not what that's not what I see, and that's not what I like. But that's not to say. So you're yeah. saying that uh, uh, that your field is also not um, not similar to Olympiad uh, kind of problem solving. No, when no. I'm, I'm terrible at Olympiad. So oh really? Wow, you you're really breaking misconceptions in. Uh, Nothing. You know, the only Olympiad problems I can solve to this day are those where I can kind of find a you know, theoretical basis for them. <laughs> I'm so relieved to hear it. <laughs> you know, in Russia, there is a, this um, obsession with math Olympiads. I mean, I think you need to be, you know, super smart to do well in math Olympiads. I think it's like A implies B, but B doesn't play. If you're good in math Olympiads, you're probably very, very smart. And so, you know, it helps. It helps a lot in every field, including mathematics, including combinatorics. Uh, but I, I think that's not, uh, it's not the same at all. Cool. I mean, I think they, people who are very good in math Olympiads probably have a ton of advantage in early stages because, you know, they're trained to think in certain ways and, you know, it helps. If they've learned something, it helps. Uh, but I think with time, it, it just becomes another tool they have that maybe others don't. So I was like in this group, special group in the university for like smart kids and all except me were like math Olympiad winners. And then they all quit math um, in the, like towards the end of our studies. And I yeah. thought the reason was that the concept of like learning a lot of theory and taking like, um, accepting lots of black boxes in the theory. Yeah. I thought 
saw to be very painful for them, I think. Right. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's just different. You know, a problem you solve, you know, you look at it and you have a great idea and it's one idea and the problem is solved. It's different from, you know, you have one idea and then you have another idea and then you have a great idea, but it's completely, you know, it doesn't help you. It's, it's just a different process. It's not the same. I, I'm working with something on something with my students now and I had this beautiful kind of picture of it and, you know, it just everything falls into place. And it doesn't solve the problem. We, are, we, were, we just had a Zoom meeting about it. And we we're all like, how is it possible? Everything falls exactly in the right place throughout the proof, except for the last line that doesn't come out. I mean, do we need one more idea or is it just like completely unrelated all this, all this uh, beautiful uh, structure that we built? I don't know. You said you work with your students on this? I, I, I work with my students a lot. I, I, I like working with students. They believe my story. <laughs> um, I mean, working with, to me, working with advanced students is the best because they're kind of, you know, they think like me. I told them to think, but they're advanced enough that, you know, they're already contributing and they have kind of their own ideas. And it's just uh, like, you know, sometimes you're talking to somebody and you can tell they're smart, but you're not thinking together. You're thinking this kind of. From different directions but i find that when i work with my students it's really like like we're thinking twice as well because uh, one and a half times as well you know, it's not exactly additive because we are thinking in the same way uh, you know sometimes you, you need another input you need another idea but often it just it just really helps if two people think about the same thing so i i, I work with my students so. isn't it it wasn't scary in the beginning to be like an adult. So, you know, your students trust you and if you bring yeah, them- Yeah, no, they're friendly. What if we don't solve the problem? I think they're under the impression that, you know, I know what to do, but every time, you know, to this day, right? They're PhD students, they test to be a problem I don't know how to solve. If I know how to solve it, it's not good enough to be a PhD problem. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, so it's, it's a story I told before, but I'll, I'll tell it again. So when I was, when I, started as a PhD student at Princeton. We had this uh, orientation and uh, uh, Charlie Pfefferman, a Fields medalist and a very distinguished mathematician was, uh, was then the director of graduate studies. And he said, you know, we are, you might think there's a huge difference between you and me, but there isn't. We are all, everybody in this building, we're all mathematicians, we're all working about, we're all working on our next theorem and we're all terrified that we won't be able to prove it. We're kind of all in the same situation. The only difference is if you've proved a hundred theorems in your life, you kind of think that probably you'll prove the next one. If you don't prove that, then you'll prove something else. And if you prove zero, zero theorems in your life, then it's really, you know, you don't know how it's going to go. And so it's true. As time goes on, kind of, you know, I, I know I'll, I'll do something. Maybe I won't do what I set out to do, but I'll do something. Uh, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's, so this is very scared to you know, hold this people's lives in my hand. My hand. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. Um, but also, as I I heard about PhD studies early on, and that I think helped me um, to see PhD PhD projects in the perspective that okay, there is this I think assumption that advisor gives you a problem and then you work on it and then you solve it. And I was told early on that advisor may give you a problem and then you may work on it and you may prove something else, not the, <laughs> not the problem you were given. <laughs> the original problem may remain unsolved. Um, right. Yeah, no, I understood that when I was already a PhD student. I, uh, I, I, I wish I had known that coming in. I think that would have made my life much, much less stressful you know, for the first few years. Was the PhD time the most uh, stressful for you in your math career? You know, yes and no. I had a, I had a great time as a PhD student. I was working with something in my advisor. We worked on the strong perfect graph theorem. We proved it. You know, it was just like everybody's dream PhD experience. Uh, so in that sense, you know, it was a great time. But on the other hand, you know, it, it was it was my second theorem. You know, I I, I didn't know if. Like, I didn't know how it was going to go. I didn't know if I was going to end up writing a thesis. You know, what if I don't do anything? What if I try and nothing comes out? 
so I think somehow knowing that that's not normal, that doesn't usually happen, would have helped me. Uh, but in, in my mind, it was much more of a kind of zero one thing. But uh, going back to your question, whether it was a stressful time in my life, I have to say, my life is just becoming better and better as I get older. I, you know, everybody tells me it's going to change, and you know, probably it's true. But, but so far, just every year, life is a little less scary. And it's, you know, I very much appreciate it. <laughs> That's amazing. People are so afraid of age and I thought it's so great that every year you learn better what you want and what you can and what you really don't have to try to, to know that you don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, when I was younger, I was always you know, jealous of older people. And so I, I, I think I was right. <laughs> I think, uh, Why were you yeah, I think, Well, kind of what you said, you know, they... They know what they can do. They know what they cannot do. They don't have to do things they cannot do. They, well, you know, you, you know which way your life is going. Have some control of your life. I was wondering, uh, how do you memorize mathematics? So how do you keep like lots of statements and uh, proofs? In, in your... I, I only remember things I can prove. If they're part of a story, then you know, I can. I remember them, and otherwise they just evaporate from my head. Really? Somehow. You only remember facts you can prove? I don't know. I'm sure I can come up with a million counterexamples now, but that's kind of my feeling. Like the things I really can use are only things that I kind of know how to prove them or how to go about proving them. Uh, anything else, you know, I, I'm not sure about it. I, I don't remember if it's plus or minus. I don't remember the constants. I don't remember, you know, if it's a min or a max. Uh, so there's some kind of vague knowledge in my head which I can tap into if necessary. But, but mostly, mostly there's, there's, there's a story and I know it. And it's like, how do you remember how old your you know, young cousin is? Well, it's because you kind of maybe don't remember exactly, but you remember roughly how old you were when his parents got married and then you know, they didn't have kids for a little while and then finally they did. And you know, at that time you lived here and there. And so, Kind of know how they are so it's, it's it's the same <laughs> so what do you think are the skills that help you to do math what are your strong sides for math research um you know it's so hard to separate now kind of what what, what was built in and what i was trained to do um I like to, to I like to understand things completely. I like to really know. I mean, I said it earlier, like to really know if it's true or false, and not just kind of, you know. I remember. Let me maybe tell you what was hard for me, which was not math, and then that would illuminate what was easy for me in what is math. So I, you know, in school, right, and like in, in high school, in middle school, I had to study physics and. Uh, the teacher would always say, so imagine, you know, a ball is rolling down a slope and you know, does this and that. And it was just mind boggling to me because like, I, I don't know, I don't, you know, send balls down the slope in my daily life. I don't know what happens to them. You tell me it's gonna, you know, start going and then slow down. You said it so many times, I believe you now, but I don't know. Uh, and and then, you know, and then the, the next, so then finally, okay, I would, you know, I would learn that balls slow down as they do they slow down or they, do they go faster? It depends on the friction. Right? It still didn't completely sink in. But, uh, but then, you know, we'll finally be done with balls and then the next subject will start. And again, they're like, so you know how this and that happens? And I'm like, no, I don't know how this and that happens. And in math, somehow, it's never like that. You start something, you start at the beginning, and you learn, you know, from the beginning up. And nobody says, you know, don't you remember what it was like when we, when we, when you were trying it, you know, yesterday at home? And uh, it, it was easy for me. It was easy for me that somehow all the knowledge is available to me all the time. I don't need to uh, kind of to, to, to rely on something uh, on, on on something else that I would have learned under some other circumstances. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, but 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 I think you know that is what's convenient for me. But that's also what helps 
with being good in math. You, you, you don't bring other experiences in. You don't sort of say, oh, you know, of course this is true. I know this is true. I tried it yesterday. I mean, maybe you do if you really try to prove it yesterday and succeeded, and today you can't remember how to do it, but, uh, but not kind of unrelated experiences. And, and, and I think it's, you know, it's a good, it's a good match. I, uh, it takes me a long time to, to declare that an experience is relevant to what I'm doing, and in math, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, you, you, you should separate what you know from what you don't know with great clarity. You know, I remember in my, uh, so when I was uh, finishing high school, um, in Israel, you, you have to take this, uh, like at the end of, it, it, throughout high school, you take your final, final exam in different subjects. And uh, uh, I think the 12th grade, you do physics, and then you do physics lab. And uh, so I was doing my final, final exam in physics lab. And, uh, and it's like, you know, it's countrywide. They, they, your teachers don't grade it. It's being sent to the Ministry of Education to be graded by some central, central educators. And, uh, and uh, I was doing this experiment and, you know, this and that. And the friction coefficient came out to be 20. And I know it's not supposed to be 20. I, I know, you know, it's just I multiplied it by 100 somewhere in the wrong place. And I keep going through my calculations and you know, no matter what I do, it's 20 and, and I'm not gonna uh, fake my experimental data. That seems like a really bad thing to do in a, in a you know, physics lab exam. But on the other hand, like I'm not an idiot. I understand it can be 20. So then I said, you know, I wrote the paragraph at the end saying, you know, I know it should be whatever, 0.2 and not 20, but I don't know where my, you know, and, and because I understand what fric friction coefficient is, I understand I made a computational mistake, but I can't find it. Uh, so I, I don't think it helped me very much. But in my heart, it helped me. Uh, so that's my most, uh, that's my saddest story about physics. <laughs> Once I understood something and even that didn't help me. No, I think it's a very sweet story. And your honesty should be appreci appreciated. You know, it's uh, partly it's honestly and partly it's like, you know, if you start lying and you don't know what you're doing, that's how you get caught, right? <laughs> you, can, well, you can only lie if you really know what you're doing. I think in real life we meet a lot of fake data yeah. or, you know, True. data trying to fit the hypothesis, let's say. Yeah. Yes. So I think this was a true mathematician's <laughs> response to, <laughs> to the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, to be honest, I, I don't know if that. But I've always wanted to know, but you don't get your exam back, so I don't. Like, I don't know how it was graded. I like to think that this paragraph affected my grade positively, but we'll never know. <laughs> I remember only one story from grading. I think it was a uh, math Olympiad or something, and and uh, there was a question, and like you were supposed to, you know, to give an answer and explain this, or so give a proof of some sort. And uh, the kid just wrote an answer. And instead of the proof, um, the kid wrote, uh, the, the answer follows by mathematical intuition. But the answer was wrong. So the, <laughs> the person who was grading it wrote below that the mathematical intuition is lacking. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, exactly. That's good. Um, this answer falls from incorrect mathematical intuition. <laughs> <laughs> Since the channel is called Math Life Balance, I'm curious, how do you rest from math? Uh, uh, so I, I, I certainly rest from math. I find it's uh, even good for math. It's certainly good for me, but it's even good for my math. Um, so I, uh, I read, I love art museums. I love going to plays. I love walking around cities. I have a seven-year-old. I enjoy spending time with him. We do all kinds of things that are not math. Uh, we do some math, but we also do a lot of things that are not math. Um, I like to cook. So I, I, mean, I, I do things. Oh. And but I am I mean, just kind of normal, non-math things that everybody else does. It's important to me. You know, I think every field can, can be all consuming and, and, and math is one of them. And it's always been very important to me to kind of 
have a life that is not affected by what I do, just so that, I mean, partly it's like a superstition thing, like, what if, you know, mass doesn't treat me well, I want to have something else. And, uh, and partly it's just, I don't like to miss out on things. And, you know, I don't want to say, you know, I haven't done this in my life because I've been trying to prove that theorem. It just strikes me as a bad, uh, it's a bad gamble. And of course, you have to make choices, right? Nobody can do everything. But I, you know, when I when I see somebody doing something and it looks like fun, I say, oh, my, I don't want to miss out on that. I should find a way to do that. So the next question would be uh, very relevant for me right now since I'm in my dacha. Um, so on holidays with my family, how do you get back to math mode after a holiday or after a break? You know, very easily. My brain just wakes up. It's just. I mean, you know, and then like all the other things, I can only do them for so long. And then you know, this masses, you know, what, what, um, how can I say, masses what comes most naturally. So when I'm bored and I have nothing else to do, which, you know, happens pretty quickly, what else am I going to do? I think, I think the answer is I, all these things that I don't want to miss out on, you know, I do them a little bit and then somehow that's enough. I, you know, I think I think it's it, it's gotten easier. I remember, you know, when I was. I mean, it's going back to that story, right? Like now, sort of. You know, that's my life. When I'm not doing anything else, I'm I'm, I'm thinking about the problem I'm thinking about. Uh, when I was, you know, when I was a younger mathematician, it was somehow more math was more disjointed in my head, and I could just do something else and you know not 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 be tempted to come back to it um it's sort of like you know if you're middle in the middle of writing a paper and let's say you know and then you went to see a movie with your friends and now you came back and kind of what you really want is to get back to writing this paper because like it's you know it's it's in your head you don't want to forget what all the indices mean uh so it's kind of like that for me now just everything i do is is just taking a break um it, it wasn't always like that, but uh, just becoming more and more like that. And I'm very grateful for it. It's nice. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and OK, another question may be um, redundant, given that you said that thinking about math has become your default state. But um, are there certain places uh, or uh, do you have a favorite institute or atmosphere that helps you to to do math or that you enjoy most? Um, I love working in coffee shops. Just, it's, it's nice, but everybody does. I think, I think I suspect it's cultural. I suspect uh, it's not me. I, I don't know, maybe in America it's cultural. But that's what people do when you have a chance to go to a coffee shop. I, that was one thing I really missed during the pandemic that you couldn't bring a laptop or you know, bring a notepad to a coffee shop. Um, I, I, I do a lot of math before I go to sleep. I sort of have this routine. I, you know, I get in bed and I read and then I think and then I fall asleep. And it's, uh, you know, because a lot of, like at least a lot of what I do, only in the final stages do you need a piece of paper and, you know, some like exact, uh, exact calculations and exact pictures. But a lot of it is just, you know, imagine a world, go for a walk in that world collect information, see what you see, and now try and you know, make it coherent. And I find that's a good time to do it. Also, like nobody needs anything from me at that time. I'm officially asleep. So possibly I've just revealed the secret that, uh, <laughs> that I didn't want to reveal. But... but wait, this is incredible. So after that, you don't get nightmares where the whole night you're like trying to prove a theorem and then you wake up being really tired and having done nothing because it was- Yeah, old. sometimes sometimes it goes the wrong way and I can't fall asleep, but, but often it's just nice. I wonder, so um, since you're, you have done uh, amazing work and uh, you have been awarded fellowships and prizes and uh, that's all great. But uh, the question I have is, uh, do you have to deal with imposter syndrome? Everybody has to deal with imposter syndrome. How, what helps you? I, what helps me just, this sentence helps me, that I, I'm convinced that the only difference people who have it and people who don't have it is that not everybody admits to it. 
I mean, you know, we all, I, look, again, we all is, you know, it's a stupid thing to say. I'm sure there are counterexamples to everything. But I think the majority of people routinely feel like they don't know. Like, uh, you know, until now, I just got very lucky. I just happened to have the right idea. But now that's it. The well is dry. And then, you know, and then it's not true. So I, I mean, I, I'm sure psychologists won't approve, but uh, uh, but my uh, uh, my way to deal with it is by suppressing it. You can't let yourself think about it, or or it will you know, become a, an obstacle for you. So you managed to just block it somehow. Well, yes, <laughs> that's also what Peter Schultz said in the interview. <laughs> Good. I'm very glad to hear. I'm very glad to hear Peter Schultz thought of it, and you know, and I'm very glad to hear that's the conclusion he came to. I don't know how you people do it. <laughs> no, you just say it's false. It is not true. Why would I say that? I can ask you a question that almost no one manages to answer. Okay. <laughs> I, I tried several times. People get very confused. So let me maybe try. My husband and I just uh, had, um, so we came to Israel and we had to take, um, uh, you know, to do blood tests to, to show that we're vaccinated. And so they, you get an answer and it's a number. So I don't know what that measures, but it's some number that measures how many antibodies you have. And his is four times higher than mine. And I'm so annoyed. So he's very amused that I'm so competitive. I'm competing with him on how many antibodies we have. Uh, so yes, ask me a question that nobody answered. <laughs> Could you tell us about any funny episode from like a seminar or a conference? I don't know, some funny story. Yeah, you know, the thing is, I'm sure I have a ton of those. It's just, it's hard to, to come up with one on the spot. Can I tell you a funny story from my teaching career? Would that, yes, would please. that go? Please. So the first time ever I taught a class, I was a graduate student at Princeton and I taught uh, uh, introduction to linear, al to linear algebra to non-mathematicians. So I think it was uh, uh, like economists, biologists, and you know, like they're all persons students, they're all very smart. Uh, most of them are very nice. And, uh, and, and I was, you know, I was a PhD student. I really had no idea what on earth I was doing, teaching anything to anyone. And I remember we were doing a, uh, you know, linear transformation, it's a transformation from RM to RN, and then the kernel is, uh, whatever I'm not saying anything that will embarrass me but in any case so, so it was an m by n matrix and uh, it was going to go from rn to rm possibly the other way around and um, I was you know, talking about it and uh, somehow I could kind of tell that they were not really following and I said well you know let's start from the beginning the vectors that this matrix operates on where does it live and nobody said anything and I said no, really, it's, let's, let's start from, you know, it's a basic question. I'm not asking you anything complicated. The vector, the vector that we start with, where does it live? And then, you know, after a few of those, the one woman who was sitting in the first row, she raised her hand and said, excuse me, we have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, no, I have a long way to go before I can teach anything to anyone. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about. Like, you know, somehow in my world, right, you know, vectors live in different places and you go from this space to that space, you know, using matrices and apparently I just had no idea who my audience were. <laughs> it's good she said. What's funnier in real life? <laughs> no, it's good she said that usually students are just, you know, silent and you don't know what they actually Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was a good group. I think they could understand the struggle was real. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand like when, when people are sitting in silent and you ask a question, they're silent and I never know if they like the question is too stupid for them to bother to answer or they have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, I think they stopped listening. I think uh, it's, it's always the same. They found something better to think about. <laughs> that was my assumption. <laughs> well, um, what, what helped you to to improve at teaching during the years? You know, I, I like talking to people. I sort of, uh, it's, it, you know, it, it, I enjoy trying to communicate with people. And if, if that's something you like doing, then eventually, you know, you, you find ways to explain things. I mean, I think partly 
you have to have some confidence, you know, to teach something to somebody, you have to have some confidence. It's very hard to teach somebody if you are not sure of yourself. Uh, so, you know, that certainly helped. And partly, you know, I somehow I, this came late to me, but I realized that if you're about to show a proof, either in a talk or in a lecture, you have to, to say it out loud to yourself. Like you can't just, the first time you present a proof, it can't be a proof you wrote on a piece of paper. You have to say it loud in words, because whenever I do it, you know, I'm, you know, I've been doing math for a long time. I've been doing talks for a long time, but even today, the first time I present a proof, I say it out loud, out loud to myself, and usually something goes wrong. Like usually, I realize that you know, I forgot to define something. There's a word that to me it means something, but to my audience, I didn't tell yet what it means. It's much better to say this first and not that first, and I don't catch it if I don't say it. And so that that really helped I think in all my presentation skills oh cool that's a good advice thank you very much you've already given I think lots of advice here and there but um, mm -hmm. at the end let me ask do you have uh, some more uh, advice for young mathematicians um you know I always give the same advice don't don't let your self-doubt stop you uh, you know if you have to stop life will tell you but if you don't want to stop and, and nothing is forcing you, don't just do it because you don't believe it in yourself. You know, yeah. there's, there's no way to tell. It's, the jury is out for all of us. We don't know. <laughs>